<clears throat> so what we're going to do, this is part three in the series from 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, part three of how to behave in the household of God. And if you don't mind, go ahead and turn in your Bibles or on your devices to 1 Timothy 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16. And I figured we'd go ahead and read these, and then I'd let you be seated. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that, to you, so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Father, I ask that you bless the reading of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So the big idea in the series, the big idea where we're at in uh, 1 Timothy 3 is that God's household is the church and that the church is charged with living in accord with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and upholding that truth and other things we've talked about so far in the series. As I scroll through my notes here, I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. Let's see. First thing we talked about is the significance of the church and how important the church is. It was important then, it's important now, and it's going to be important until the Lord returns. Amen? Amen. The church is important. We're the expression of God's family as believers, Christ followers. We make up the family of God. We're his household. We're his children. Point number two that we talked about from this passage we are the dwelling place of God's presence. That's why I chose the songs I did this morning. This is something I really believe that we all take lightly sometimes. And we don't take it as serious as we ought. We are the dwelling place of God's presence. Amen? Point number three, we are the guardians of God's word. The church are the guardians of God's word. That means we protect it. We study it, we know it, we live it, we share it. If somebody's teaching false teaching, we confront it. Amen? Amen. False doctrine hurts people. It hurts people. It destroys the faith of some people. So we're the guardians of God's word. We are to preserve God's word. We are to proclaim it. God dwells among us. There's so much good stuff in here. And so what I'm going to do now is we're going to tie this all in together uh, between verses 14 and 16. And so one of the things I want us to notice if you're, if you're looking at that passage is that after Paul talks about the significance of the church, like how important the church is, he turns his attention to the supremacy of Christ in verse 16. And you can see that here. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. So what does he mean when Paul's talking about the supremacy of Christ? What does he mean? What's he talking about here in relation to the mystery of godliness? So we know Scripture clearly teaches Christ is supreme above all else. Amen? Amen? And so what does Paul mean by the mystery of godliness? How does the supremacy of Christ relate to the mystery of godliness? In this letter, we need to, we need to acknowledge something. Paul uses this word godliness nine times throughout this letter. 
Now, if you know anything about reading scripture and Bible study, if somebody repeats the same thing over and over and over again, what does that mean? It's important, right? Like if you see the word therefore, you say, what's that therefore, therefore, right? What comes before the therefore? Because it's important. Um, so yeah, Paul uses this word godliness nine times. And what does it mean for you and I to have godliness, for believers in the church to have godliness? This is so important for us to get a grip on today. It means having a God consciousness. What does it mean to be conscious of something? You're aware of it, right? Being conscious of something means to be aware of that something, right? And so what this means, what Paul is getting around to is where to be constantly aware of his presence. Those times when you're tempted to sin and you think you're alone and you think that no one's going to see it. Guess what? Who lives in you, believer? The Holy Spirit. When we choose to sin in the dark, does that mean God can't see it? You want to chop the legs off of temptation? Remember that God lives in you when you're tempted to sin and that he's right there with you. Amen. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. Preaching to myself. I say it every Sunday. We are to be constantly aware of the presence of God in us and in our lives. At the same time, what Paul's getting at here is we have to have a God-centeredness. A God-centeredness that affects everything we do in our lives. And what does that mean? Look at this. This is another one of Paul's letters. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How would you all define whatever? And I'm not talking about when your teenager is giving you an attitude and you say, can you take out the trash? You haven't taken it out in three days. And they're like, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. Y'all are too lively. You got to calm down. You got to, you got to bring it down just a little bit. It's more like no matter what you do. Whatever means everything, yeah. right? And so he uses another word that goes with it. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When y'all were here yesterday and you were throwing an event to reach out to people in the community and you were serving the Lord and serving others, which by the way, some of you weren't here for me to thank you. You're here now. Thank you so much. Listen, I'm going to pause for just a second. My friend Ryan is a pastor and he and his wife were here and I was working yesterday because I had to work and he sent me a message and he said, Eric, you've got a really great core group here because he saw y'all working together, worshiping God, loving people and, uh, and what you were doing. And so I just want to thank you for that. Let's keep going. Hopefully this stirred something up in us to say, okay, what are we doing next, right? We're gonna take a break because I know y'all are exhausted. But the next time we have an event where we're reaching out to the community and using our resources to do that, man, it's a good feeling knowing that, knowing that kids were provided backpacks and school supplies that may not have otherwise been able to get those things, right? So let's get back to here. God-centeredness that affects all that we do in every aspect of our lives. So does this mean when I'm talking to my wife, I should be aware of God's presence as I'm talking to my wife? Did God give me my wife? Yeah. Does God love my wife? Yeah. Should I be careful how I talk to her? Yeah. Not because I'm afraid of her but because I fear God and I respect God. And my wife is a believer, which makes her a daughter of the king, just as much as I am a son of the king. 
we did a devotion one time and it talked about, do we see our spouse as um, God's son or daughter, which would make God our father-in-law? And there was a question in there that convicted me somewhat and it said, uh, how are you treating God's daughter? And I was like, whew, I think I better, I better pray. Well, you know, not that I mistreat my wife, but um, what about if I'm, what about if I'm talking to Jess or Jean about a church issue and maybe we might not agree on it? Does that mean I can fly off the handle and be a jerk? No, that means Jess and Jean are saved. They're believers. They belong to God. Christ died for them. Do I need to be God conscious in that moment when I might be tempted to get angry or then they haven't done anything wrong? I'm just using it as an example. Justin, on the other hand, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. But you guys see what I'm getting at, right? Here's something that convicted me and I'm opening myself up and being transparent and Jess would joke and say, I still can't see through you. <laughs> Jess, it's good to have, I love seeing you back there, brother. I'm so happy you're, you're doing well. It's good to have you back. But here's, and I'm just going to be, I joke around a lot. I'm being serious. Do you know what convicts me here lately? My food choices. I'm just being real. I got health issues and this and that. Do you think I could be a little more God conscious in my food choices? Could I honor God by choosing to eat better? Let's just be real. Let's just be real. Whatever means whatever, all means all. When you're talking to people, when you're, when you're doing things, when you're working, right? When you're working, when there's ministry things that you can be doing. And so at the same time, I mean, everything means everything. So this, I put a note in here, literally meaning all of our thoughts, attitudes, words, actions, dreams, and plans, right? Should be thought, spoken, dreamt, and acted out to the glory of God. When you're in a situation, you think, is what I'm, is what I'm thinking glorifying to God? Is what I'm about to say going to glorify God? Is what I'm fixing to do going to glorify God? Maybe I've made a mistake. How can I ask for forgiveness, repent, turn that around and glorify God? Whatever is whatever, all things means all things. Someone has sinned against you. How can I forgive this person in a way that will glorify God? All things means all things, y'all. What does Paul mean by the mystery of godliness? Let me pause. There are things about God that you and I are just never going to fully understand. We can't. Our human minds, we can't. And so you know what that means? We got to trust God that he knows. Are you hearing me this morning? There are people that refuse to believe in God because they don't have all the answers they want. Well, you know what? God gives us all the answers we need. And that's more than enough. Amen. The mystery of God. It's a mystery. We're not going to completely understand what we're about to dive into here. And that's okay. God understands it. Just trust God with it and let God be God and, and we'll obey. Amen. We'll trust and obey just like the old hymn says. So what Paul's talking about here, he's not talking about something that can't be solved, like an unsolved mystery. He's not talking about something that's necessarily hard to figure out, right? He's talking about something that was hidden for a time, but now has been revealed, okay? So in verse 16, I think I did this here. Yeah, in verse 16, we see that the mystery of godliness has everything to do with Christ. But what, uh, what's Paul's desire for the Ephesian Christians? And if you want to know how this applies to us today as Christians, Paul desired to see the believers act right in the household of God, verse 15. 
He's talking about something deeper than just good behavior. He's talking about acting in accordance with the truth. This is deeper than just simple behavior modification. Right? We've seen behavior modification forced on people. You know, if you do this, you're going to get shocked or whatever, right? And so people are like, well, I better not do that. They don't understand the ins and outs. They just know I'm going to get shocked if I do that, right? Just a lame example. So what Paul is getting at is not just that we behave right, but that we understand why, why we should behave right. Is that making sense? I don't know about you, but if someone tells me, don't do that, this is the way we've always done this. And I say, okay, but I go, wait a minute. Why is it done that way? Like, where'd that come from, these rules and regulations? If someone takes the time to explain it to us, this is why so-and-so got hurt one time, or this is unsafe, or this is more cost-effective, or, or whatever it may be, right? Once I understand, oh, okay. It helps me to behave, not just because there's gonna be discipline or, or punishment or whatever if I don't behave, but I actually understand this is why I need to do these things. Is this making sense? Amen. So this is what Paul's getting at. He's getting to something that's, that's much deeper. And what truth is that? This is the truth that we're to get at. The truth of who Christ is and all that he accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection and ascension. A lot of times we leave the ascension out of it, right? We say the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, but then we fail to mention he ascended. You know, sometimes we talk about Jesus in, in the past tense, like he's, he's not still alive. He's still alive. And so if you're a genuine born again believer in Jesus Christ, here's what we're getting at. You're going to have a strong desire, a deep conviction to live a godly life. Let me warn you. This goes for all of us. Again, I'm preaching to myself. If you ever get to a point to where you've got a pet sin, quote unquote, and you get comfortable with it, like it just doesn't bother you anymore to, to do this. Red flag, y'all. It's a big red flag. Listen, being a believer in Jesus Christ does not mean you're never going to sin again. But it should mean if you do sin, there's a deep sense of conviction that makes you want to stop. Not just stop the behavior, but you understand why you should stop the behavior. Amen? This is what we do as the family of God in God's household. This is what we do. The next question is this when we look at this passage. How does Jesus reveal the mystery of godliness? How does he reveal that to you and me and to the world? By displaying the majesty of God. Please let all this sink in this morning. Man, we, we are singing about Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us, God in us. If you grasp that, if you can wrap your mind around that, it doesn't only change your behavior, it changes your wants, desires. So how does Jesus reveal the mystery of godliness by displaying the majesty of God? That's your answer. That's another answer. The majesty of God, what is this we're talking about here? So the majesty of God, it's another way that we see the supremacy of Christ. And I'm borrowing this next portion from a commentary. Like it's, I put it in my words, but the ideas and all the points came from the commentary, okay? Just to be straightforward. So there's six truths related to Christ's supremacy that we can see in just these three verses, right? 14, 15, and 16. 
And here they are, there's six of them, and don't panic. They're not, they're not really long, okay? <laughs> but they are important. So the first one, the Son of God was manifested in the flesh. I don't know about y'all, but that just boggles my mind. That the God that made everything that exists everywhere became a human being for you and me. Let that sink in deep. You know how big the universe is? You ever look at things through a microscope? This is kind of weird, and I don't have it in my outline. I'm just kind of going along. The other day, I was watching uh, on social media. Somebody said, hey, let's look at a banana in a microscope, right? And they put it in a microscope, and they magnified it like, I forget, but it was, it was big. And uh, you look in there, and you see all these things that make up the banana, things that you can't see with the naked eye, right? And I'm thinking... The God of the universe, we're on planet Earth, and there are so many other planets and stars that are way bigger than the Earth ever thought of being, amen, so to speak. And that God that created and sustains millions of stars and planets and galaxies and all that became a man on Earth. How, how small is that? And I don't mean to make little of it. I mean, I'm, I mean to make a big deal about it. God became a man. You want to know how much our God loves us? He became a man for us. Look at this. You want, there is so much evidence. And well, there's so many verses in scripture that clearly say, that God became a man, he's the savior, that the, that the Bible's true, everything the Bible says about Jesus is true. Look at this. You wanna know from scripture that God was manifested in the flesh in Jesus? Look at this. Isaiah 9, 6. We read it all the time at Christmas. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. It doesn't say the son's born, it says the son is given. Interesting. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. What's next? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's keep going. I know my wife's gonna be excited because this is one of a couple of her favorite passages. John 1 verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. Uh-oh. Doesn't it also say Jesus is the living, is the word? Jess has interesting thoughts on that. If you want to ask him about that later. Now look at this. Let's skip down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Does that mean that the word's Jesus. The word is God. And so, okay. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. And then lastly, this one's big. They're all big, but I mean, kind of in a weird state this morning. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And that's Colossians 2, 9. So it's basically saying everything that God is, is in Jesus, in the flesh. Are we going to understand that? No, there's a mystery to it. We're thankful for it, but there's a mystery to it. Second, he was verified by the Spirit. We also see this in verse 16. Verified by the Spirit. That's number two. Some translations say vindicated. It, it means the exact same thing, okay? And so what's the context here? The work of the Spirit in affirming that Jesus Christ is God's Son. And if you remember from Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, look at this. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, 
And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Could you imagine? Whoa, right? We were down there at Creek Day baptizing folks. What if some really awesome person come up out of the water and all of a sudden, you know, the heavens open and a dove lands on him and it says, this is my son. You think we're going to be like, what the world is going on? So we see it as baptism. Jesus is there. The Father's there. The Holy Spirit is there. Amen. What about all the signs and wonders? Doesn't it say at the end of the, at the book of John that if everything would have been written down that Jesus did in, in the time he was here on earth, there's not enough books in all the world that contain it all. What am I trying to do today? How can I say it? Jesus is not just some historical figure, right? He's not just, you know, people are like, oh, he's the one that died on the cross. Yeah, I know who he is. I know him. Listen to me. This glorious resurrected Christ lives in the believer. I want us all to walk out of here today just in awe of the glory of God. Amen? Can we do that this morning? And not just treat it like it's, oh, that's, that's neat. No. God in us. It's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Look at this. The signs and wonders, right? We've studied those. You've heard about them your whole Christian life, maybe even before you became a believer. But look at this, John 3, 2. We know the drill here. This man, it's talking about Nicodemus, a religious leader of the day. So even the religious leaders saw all the signs and wonders that Jesus was doing, right? And some of them didn't believe and they tried to kill him. Others were like, there's no way somebody could do all the things you're doing and, and not be from God. You have to be. Look at this. This man is talking about Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. No one can do what you're doing unless God is with them. And he was one of the most well-respected religious leaders of the day. So people everywhere, people got healed. They heard Jesus teach. You, you see other passages where they're like, no one's ever taught like this man. No one's ever taught with this much authority. Like, this guy's different. He's special. There's something different about Jesus. Believe me, there is something very different about Jesus. Do you know what ultimately was the vindication or verification of Jesus being who he said he was? His resurrection. Jesus said, I am all these things. I'm paraphrasing. I am all these things. The Savior. Me and the Father, we are one. If you kill me, I'm just going to rise again in three days. Right? If you tear down this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. It wasn't until later they were like, he was talking about his, his body. Guys, listen to me. Jesus is so mind-blowingly amazing. And he lives in you and me. If you're a believer today or you're a believer watching on, on the YouTubes, this God, this Jesus, this Holy Spirit lives in you. We have no excuse to misbehave as the household of God. Zero. God has given us everything we need 
to behave in the house of God. To be the church, to do the mission that he's called us to do, to share the gospel, to love people, right? The world is supposed to look at the church and go, the love that they have for God and each other is so special. I want to be a part of that. I need that. My prayer for Providence, and I know it's yours too, a lot of you, is that Providence will be such a church that when people interact, if we're 10 miles away from here and someone interacts with one of our members at a store, they see Jesus in that member. And that member shares Jesus with that person. And maybe that person comes to church. And when they walk through the doors, they're like, God is truly in this place. God is in these people. I need God. I need that. God save me. How glorious would that be? That's why the church is so important. That's why we have to behave in the household of God. Listen, if we're not getting along and there's disunity and there's backbiting and we're accusing each other of stuff and, and so on and all that, how does that glorify God? It doesn't. When people see that, they come here to a church and they say, it's no different than being in the world. Why would I want to be a part of that? Those people treat each other the same way worldly people treat each other. Church, we are supposed to be different. We have God in us. We're supposed to be different. And I'm not yelling at anybody or anything. I just got done saying how good of a job y'all did. I guess why I'm saying this so passionately is because I want that momentum to keep going. Who's with me? Let's, let's keep that momentum going. Yes, you get tired and you get wore out and it's hard work. But when a kid gets saved, isn't it worth it? When the parent of a child or a grandparent gets saved, isn't it all worth it? You think you're going to be in heaven complaining about how tiring it, all the work was? I thank God for each and every one of you. We have got to understand that God lives in us. Amen? We got to behave like the church. Okay. And so I guess another reason I'm preaching this this morning is because it's in the text. But as we grow, as people come in, right? As people visit, as they come in, as they say, hey, I like Providence. I think God's leading me to, to plug in here. We can say, that's great. Praise God. But this is what's expected. Are y'all hearing me? This is what's expected. I had a visitor, it's been a while ago, came here and said, uh, pastor made me angry and we're looking for a new church. I said, you need to go back to your church and mend things with your pastor. Don't bring that mess to Providence, right? And I, I don't mean that in a, it's, it's like, if, if you're gonna do that to the pastor you have now, at some point, I'm gonna upset you and you're just gonna leave here. I said, go back home to your home church, set up a private meeting with your pastor. Have you talked to him about it? No, you need to do that ASAP. Go and tell him in a Christ-like way, this is what happened, I'm upset about it. I said, and if he's a, a pastor, he's gonna say, man, I'm sorry, right? I'll get off my soapbox. So ultimately, the resurrection of the dead was the uh, decisive indication of Jesus' verification of vindication by the Spirit. Look at this. Let's look at a couple passages. Romans 1, 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So could you imagine living back then and people saying, oh man, did you hear Jesus was crucified and they threw him in a tomb? Ah, I knew he wasn't the savior. Hold up. <laughs> There's 500 witnesses just saw him walking around, talking, interacting with people. Wait, what? And then you go and you investigate this and it's true. Even non-Christian historians are like, yeah, he was, they saw him alive again. I'm telling you, look at this. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who what? Dwells in you. Number three, the third thing, he was praised among the heavens. Here's another Christmas verse. Luke 2, 13 through 14. He was praised among the heavens. Look what the angels did. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. So even the angels are singing at Jesus' birth, right? Look at this. The angels announced Jesus' resurrection. Matthew 28, right? One through seven. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. I think I would too. <laughs> Let's continue. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. And he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Could you imagine getting to the tomb of your, your Lord and Savior? And it's empty. But an angel tells you, if you go to this place, you're going to see him. How excited would you be? Doesn't scripture tell us if we go to heaven, we'll see him? Doesn't scripture tell us if you put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll be saved from the penalty of your sin and you get to see Jesus? Why are we not more excited about that? James and I were making food. This was last year, I think. James and I were making food in the kitchen. Random thought. And we're just having father-son time, right? Cooking up some food. And it got quiet for a second. James goes, Dad, can I ask you something? I said, yeah. He goes, why are people afraid? I said, afraid about what? He goes, for Jesus coming back. He goes, why are people so afraid of that? And I'm like, well, if, if he's their savior, they should be excited about it. If he's going to be their judge, then they have every right to be terrified, right? <clears throat> and James gets this look on his face. I'll never forget it. And he goes, well, he goes, I'm excited about it. He goes, I want to see him, man. He goes, I want to see him so bad. And he's like, I know that Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, X-Men, he goes, that's all stories of heroes that are made up. He goes, Jesus is legit. <laughs> Jesus is legit. He goes, I can't wait to see him. He's like, I'm a freak out. Shouldn't we all have that same, uh, come back, come get me, right? It's important that we do what he wants us to do while we're here. He's got something he wants us to do. He wants us to live for him, glorify him and share the gospel, right? Enjoy our relationship with him while we're here. Look at this. I've always found this, and please don't take this the wrong way. I've always found this kind of humorous, okay? Okay. Let me explain before everybody, you know, don't throw things at me. In Acts 1, 9 through 11, look at what it says here. This is when Jesus is ascending uh, back up into heaven, right? And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. So he's literally like floating back up to heaven. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? Right? In other words, like, what are you doing just standing around? <laughs> right? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way 
as you saw him go into heaven. Folks, he's coming back. It may be while we're still alive, it may not be. That's up to God. But he's coming back. One way or another, we're going to see him. We're going to stand before him. Let me encourage you, if you're a lost person today, don't see him lost. Get right with him now so when you do see him, you can rejoice and celebrate and be thankful and thank him for what he's done for you so that you can be saved. Fourth, he was proclaimed over all the earth. Some translations say preached among the nations. Uh, the early disciples started proclaiming Jesus and the proclaiming of Jesus continues all over the world today. It's not stopped. Fifth, fifth, he is the savior of the world. Jesus was believed on in the world. You see that in verse 16. All over the world, the gospel of Jesus is being preached to this day and will continue to be preached until Jesus returns. Praise God, all people everywhere can still cry out to Jesus in faith and repentance and be saved from the penalties of their sins. Amen. That's why we do what we do. This church is not a social club. It's not a social club where selected members that, you know, we can come here and, and uh, have our little get togethers. And this is supposed, it's not a cruise ship. This is a battleship. This is a battleship. Spiritual warfare is real and we're all mixed up in it, right? And so let's, let's throw some life preser preservers out to some folks, right? Let's see here. Sixth, he reigns as king over the entire universe, which is kind of what I was getting at earlier. The sun, moon, and the stars, trillions of stars. He, he made all of it. He's over all of it. And that same God chose to live inside you and me. Mind-blowing. Jesus was taken up in glory to the Father's right hand. This is the mystery of godliness, y'all. Look at Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We're almost done, I promise. Just a few more minutes here. When Paul was communicating these truths, he was not only proclaiming who Jesus is, he was also proclaiming what this means for all believers, past, present, and future. These truths are how we have godliness uh, these truths are how we have godliness in our lives and godliness in the church. It is truly an awe-inspiring reality that Christ lives within us, believers. This means that Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, who was verified by the Spirit, raised from the dead, praised among the angels, proclaimed all over the world, believed on his Savior, and crowned as King over the entire universe, lives in you and me if we're a believer. Amen? And my note, it says this is not something to be taken lightly. The Son of God lives in you, giving you all the grace, power, and strength you will ever need to live a life of godliness. In one of my commentaries, there are several different ones I, I read. I found this, and I tried to put it in my own words, and I just couldn't seem to get it as good as this guy did. So again, I'm going to quote directly from one of my commentators. I want you to listen to how he put this. It's just, it's really powerful. Quote, there is a powerful application here for all of us who follow Christ. Brother or sister in Christ, are you going through a difficult time? Christ lives within you. Are you struggling in weakness? Christ is strengthening you. Are you bruised and battered? Christ is healing in you. Are you confused and not sure what to do? Christ is peace in you. Are you wondering if you can overcome the things you're dealing with right now? As 1 John says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. He is life. He is strength. He is hope in you. He is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We get that from Colossians 1.27. 
Jesus has conquered sin, death, and the grave, and he now reigns from heaven as the ascended Lord. Because he lives in you, you have nothing to fear. We're going to conclude. This is my closing statement that I jotted down here. In light of these truths we've looked at today, we need to live God-centered lives that are Christ-empowered lives. We as believers are members of God's family. We belong to the household of God. And we need to behave like it. Right? I've seen so much good things happening in this church. Let's keep our momentum going. Amen? Let's keep this momentum going.